Good evening. I'm Dr. Darlene Rossetti, the Regional Superintendent of DuPage County Schools. I want to welcome our live stream viewers, as well as those joining us via our YouTube channel this evening. As you know, we are going through a very challenging time as a country because of, of the coronavirus pandemic. And many of us, parents, educators, teachers, and even grandparents like me are wondering, how are our children doing? Some kids may be a little bit more fearful, some more angry, some frustrated or disappointed, some talking more, some talking less, some isolating themselves, some just seeming a little bit off. Social distancing and remote learning is affecting our students in so many ways, even when we can't quite put our finger on what they are. Our main mission at the Regional Office of Education is to care for the children in DuPage County, educationally, physically, and emotionally. And that's why tonight we are so honored to be joined by Dr. Melissa Sadie. Dr. Sadin is an expert in trauma and crisis and how it affects children. She is going to share with us how this pandemic and the changes our children are experiencing is impacting their lives. She is also going to give us specific strategies to create trauma-informed virtual classrooms and homes so we can better care for the children entrusted to us. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'd like to turn this over right now to Assistant Regional Superintendent Joan Glatzbach. Thank you, Darlene. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for this evening's live stream. It is being recorded and will be available on the DuPage ROE YouTube channel. If you have questions throughout this live stream or even after this session, please email us at dupagestrong at dupageroe.org. That's DuPage Strong, D U P A G E S T R O N G, at dupageroe.org. We will be compiling questions throughout the event. Some questions will be answered at the end of today's presentation, and some questions will guide our next session. And now let's welcome Dr. Melissa Sadin. Dr. Sadin has served as a special education teacher, a gifted education teacher, and a building administrator. She is currently working as Director of Special Education. Publicly, Dr. Satan has been Vice President of the Local School Board and serves as the Director of the Creating Trauma-Sensitive Schools Program for the Attachment and Trauma Network. She has conducted research on the perceptions of teachers working to create trauma-informed classrooms. Dr. Satan is a published author and has produced numerous webinars on children with attachment trauma in schools. Currently, Dr. Satan works as an education consultant and developmental trauma expert, providing professional development to school districts, municipal service providers, and parents. As an adoptive mother, Dr. Satan provides firsthand expertise in her work with adoptive parents at conferences and in other formal and informal settings. Her Trauma Guide series of books are available on her website, www.traumasensitive.com. And now let's welcome Dr. Melissa Sabin. Thank you, Joan. It is wonderful to be back in DuPage County. Welcome everyone and good evening. Let's get rolling. Okay, so the first thing that I'd like to share with you tonight, there will be a lot of resources I hope that you find helpful to you as you navigate this interesting place that we find ourselves in. Um, the Attachment Trauma Network, I am the director of their schools program. They also serve families and parents and communities. And there are a number of tremendous resources. There are webinars. Right now we are hosting um, an informal um, help me through this event session on Friday evenings um, for parents. You just log in and tell us what's on your mind. We have a licensed clinical social worker who's a member of our parent organization, and she will be there to help you through it. So I encourage you to check out the website and the resources that are there. I got into this work, um, I'm not telling you how many years ago because people count, um, but my husband and I found my son Theo in a Bulgarian orphanage when he was three years old. And I was at that point, a special education teacher and I had my master's degree 
Um, my thesis for my master's was on um, behavior challenge children. And so I was an expert in behavior modification. I got my BCBA and it was mystifying to me that this beautiful little boy that I had in my home um, was not responding to any of the things that I knew as an expert in behavior. And so this book, A Teacher's Guide, is really kind of, um, it's Theo's story and my story um, and my journey from becoming, uh, from being a, a strictly behavioral um, approach to children to learning about this whole new world of how trauma impacts us and how we need a different approach. Um, the other books in the, in the series, as Joan mentioned, I write, um, I wrote a book about resilience through the arts. That's integrated arts. It's good for our teachers, but it's good for anyone teaching in a classroom because if you integrate arts, you will help to heal trauma in your classroom. I spent some time um, in the middle of my career um, with gifted children. There is a very unique crossover between gifted children and gifted children who have trauma. Uh, and this book gets to that. These are my two newest books in the series. Very excited to finally have them finished. Uh, School Leaders, Guide to Trauma, because leading this approach requires, again, a, a different understanding of school leadership. And finally, after many people begged, a trauma-informed teaching strategies book. Please understand that there are so many more strategies that I could put in one book excellent teaching is trauma-informed. This work starts and ends with you, the adults who care for these children. You must seek comfort and you must take care of yourself. And we'll talk about what that might look like for you. There's um, that old picture everybody has in their head. Um, there used to be a card, I can tell you, because I fly all the time, it's no longer there. Um, when you take an airplane ride and it shows the um, oxygen mask and that you should put the oxygen mask on yourself first and then if you're traveling with a child, well, my friends, it is time for you to pull down an oxygen mask, but it is very important for you to put it on yourself first. You cannot help your children if you don't understand what you need. There are two types of self-care really. Um, macro self-care is the one that most people think of when people tell you to take care of yourself. Um, it's something that might take you more than 30 minutes, like a jog or a walk um, or a yoga class or going to the gym. It may cost money. It doesn't have to. Um, but those gym memberships or the yoga studio or um, even, you know, the at-home apparatus that you might use. But basically, you do it for 30 minutes or more. Very good for you. Um, one of the things that this um, pandemic has given us is the gift of time. My whole life, I have been looking for time, time for patience, time for understanding, time to read that book, time to finish that email. I find uh, for the first time, maybe in my life, that I actually have time. Um, so I encourage you to use this time um, to engage in some macro self-care. We also have micro self-care. Um, this is often free um, and, and can take and should take less than 30 minutes. Micro self-care is using the tools and I, we will discuss this later as we go and I will refer back to macro and micro self-care throughout our time this evening because this whole thing is about you taking care of yourself. Um, that's a picture of a glitter wand, bubbles, those are silicone sponges. I get them at um, Amazon um, because they feel good. Rubbing a silicone sponge between your fingers actually will increase the um, release of serotonin in your brain, which is the happy hormone. So it's micro self-care, things you can do, holding silly putty, doing some coloring. All of these things you can do in between um, activities throughout your day and it will alter your stress response system and improve it. And I just love this. One of the happy accidents of this work is that um, Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, who I will talk about a lot this evening, he's one of my big heroes. And those of you who have heard me speak before know that I, um, well, I'm madly in love with him and, and he knows it and his wife knows it. And my husband knows it. 
Um, but his work is groundbreaking in this area. And he found um, that children who were coloring during other activities that he was doing to measure the responses in their brain um, had better auditory processing opportunities uh, than children who were having the same activities in his lab, but not coloring. Um, your brain, your ability to take information in through your ears and put it in a place where you can use it later is greatly enhanced when you're coloring. Teachers, we're used to saying, you know, put that coloring down and pay attention. I encourage you to say, why don't you take your coloring out and pay attention? If you're at home and you have some coloring, get it out right now and give it a try. Okay, this work is about shifting perspectives. It's about understanding that you might have to look at something you've looked at your whole life in a slightly different way. So take a look at this picture. I would love for you to tell me what you, what you would see here, but I can't hear you. So I will tell you that there are two images and your brain saw one of these two images first. If you've seen this picture before, then you quickly saw the other. There is an old woman. Um, she has a very pronounced nose and mouth. Um, both of these women are wearing a scarf on their head. But there's also a young woman. She's sort of looking away. So you're looking at her chin line and her ear and her eyelash. So if you can see and train yourself to see both of those images, then you are on your way to understanding how trauma impacts all of us. It's about being able to see something and know that two things can be true at the same time. Uh, just take a minute and stare right at this young man. What starts to happen? Isn't that cool? His face starts to flip back and forth. You can see him looking both ways because we are all more than one thing at a time. I really hope that you are not in the middle of your workday the same person you are on a Saturday evening doing what it is you like to do best. We have to understand that our children, our students, are definitely more than one thing at a time. Here's an old friend. Now I have been looking at this FedEx logo for many, many years. And um, when my friend sent this to me and said there's a hidden image, I stared at it and I looked at it and I took my eyes away and I carried around my phone for a couple of weeks and I kept looking at it and I couldn't see anything but what I had always seen, the FedEx logo. And then my son Noah, my second son, peeked over my computer one day and he said, oh, well, mom, it's the arrow between the E and the X. There is an arrow, FedEx put it there on purpose because they move your things forward. Please remember FedEx as we go through this evening. You may have been looking at some of this information and at children for a very long time. All of us were children at some point, but you have to consider that there might be a new way to look at some old information. All right, so let's make sure we know what trauma means before we go on with how to help all of us through this. Single event trauma. Single event trauma is um, something that you're all familiar with. Um, it is um, the, the diagnosis for this has been around for a long time. Um, it's called post-traumatic stress disorder. Dr. Vanderkolk authored what we now know as post-traumatic stress disorder. When one event occurs and it shifts your stress response system and you become unwell, post-traumatic stress disorder is real. If you have childhood exposure to, to trauma, you do not get post-traumatic stress disorder. You have what we call developmental trauma. Developmental trauma is also defined by Dr. Bessel van der Kolk. It's not in the book where we put all of the, our psychological and mental illness diagnoses yet um, because he's still doing some research. Developmental trauma is basically the exposure to any of the things you can see here, one or more of them between conception and the age of 18 when your brain is doing most of its growing. I wanna point out just a few here. Poverty, the reason I point that out, sometimes trauma can be something that's no one's fault. Um, if you lose your job and your spouse loses their job and you find that you need to change your living experience 
and the neighborhood maybe is not what you hope for, but there you are doing the best you can with what you have. Um, those things will impact the way your children grow. It might not be your fault. It doesn't mean that you don't love your children. Keep in mind that if you are living below the poverty line, you need to understand that your children have an early childhood trauma exposure. It's not a problem as long as you understand it, recognize it, and know how to mitigate, okay? Teachers, please understand, if you have children coming to your school from places where they may not have meals every day, three times a day without school helping, um, but they might have parents who love them very much. So please understand that in many cases, um, trauma is not someone hurting children. As you can see, there are some circles there where people do hurt children, but many of them are not. Um, cultural and intergenerational trauma is a brand new study. It's very exciting um, work to watch um, what happens to the gene pool of a people who experience generations of trauma. For instance, the African-Americans um, who were in slavery in this country, um, our First Nations, our people um, of our Native American tribes, their gene pools were actually altered from the ongoing trauma. We believe this is happening to families that are in their third and fourth generation of poverty or living in a violent place, a war zone. Um, and this science is going to help us greatly. I draw your attention to separation. That is very, very important. As we go on, I will talk more about the importance, but separation can be um, foster care, it can be adoption, it can be incarceration, it can be, um, I, I knew a woman who was Asian Indian and it was her responsibility to um, care for her parents until they passed. And so she had to go back to India to do that. And she left her husband and her two young children here uh, in the United States for four years. So those children were separated from her. Um, this will impact the way their brains grow. Separation, again, may not be someone's fault. Certainly, we know children whose parents occasionally pass away, okay? So keep all of these things in mind as we talk about um, the brain and when we get to things you can do to help your family. Um, a trauma-informed home or school um, is any organization, really, that has the four R's. You need to realize the prevalence of trauma and you'll be done with that this evening. So there you go. You need to recognize how it impacts the brain. I will give you an understanding of that tonight. You certainly are welcome to do much more reading and considering. You need to respond in a trauma-informed way, which is where I hope to spend most of the evening. And then ongoing, changing the way you've always done things, maybe with this information so that you resist re-traumatizing. That's kind of an ongoing journey, if you will. Okay, realizing the prevalence of trauma is best done by understanding the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. 1997, doctors Anda and Paletti did a study. They were working with Kaiser Permanente in California on um, the study of obesity. Why? Why are Americans, why is that a uniquely American condition? Why does it cost this country $282 million a year um, so they were studying the why of obesity. One of the things that Dr. Anda and Dr. Paletti discovered in their surveys of these people was that all of them had been hurt as children in some way, separated, abandoned, neglected. Um, they were hungry. Some form of those things from Dr. Vanderkolk's circles that you just saw. So they had to stop. They were so overwhelmed by that similarity that they decided to go and do a study. And they took 17,000 white middle-class college kids to keep the, the sample homogeneous for their first study. And they asked them 10 questions. And the 10 questions were based on these areas, which all come from Vanderkolk's definition of developmental trauma. So obviously you can see abuse there, the types of neglect, but also things that happen in the household. You see divorce there. Parents, I must let you know that divorce is only an adverse experience if it occurs with one of the other things up here. 
If it is the only thing um, in your household, your children do not have trauma. I also will encourage you, if you are all safer and happier by going through a divorce, um, please go do what is safe and best for you, your emotional needs and your children. Um, because these are labeled adverse experiences doesn't mean that you can't overcome them with your children, okay? So these are the 10 ACEs. They added poverty in 2005. That's why it's written there in red. Now, what they found out when they did this first study, here were the results. Basically, 64% of these middle-class college kids, 64% of them were saying yes to these questions, meaning they had ACEs, meaning this is far more prevalent in our country than I was raised to believe. When I was um, going through high school and college, we basically assumed that it was 25% of any population of people. It is far more than that. We need to realize the prevalence. It is in every group of people that get together. Someone has ACEs. This is what Dr. Anna and Dr. Paletti want you to know. This is directly connected to you understanding why you need to take care of yourself. The way that you read this wheel is that, for instance, you are 67% more likely to have life dissatisfaction if you have three or more aces. Three is the line in the sand. So if you have one or two aces, they may not impact your overall health. If you have five or six, they will impact your health more than a person who has three. These are the commonalities, things that they are finding with people who have these adverse experiences. One of the best parts about Dr. Anda's work is the hope. What they are finding is that if you engage in that self-care that we were talking about, you can turn these numbers back. It's very difficult to undo, for instance, if you are a smoker, and your doctor tells you you're gonna die 10 years earlier because you've smoked, then you quit smoking, excellent. But you can't gain back those years. You just don't take any more because you're not doing any more damage to your lungs. This is different than that. You can actually turn these things back by taking care of yourself, by understanding your ACE score and taking care of your stress response system. It's very important to go to acestohigh.com. They have a downloadable PDF of the original ACES survey. If you take it and add up your yeses, you will have your number. You can take it on behalf of your children. Please, please, please do not give this survey to anyone under the age of 15. Mothers and fathers, please do not give it to your children. Take it on behalf of them. Teachers, this is not something you need to know the A score of every child in your class. You can assume that half the children in any gathering has some ACEs, but the best part about trauma-informed care is it's good for all of us. So it's, if you conduct a trauma-informed home or school, you're gonna be taking care of everyone and you don't need to know their A score for that. So what does trauma do, second R? What does trauma do to the brain? This is an oversimplified picture of the limbic system, which is the part of your brain that's most heavily impacted by trauma. The amygdala is our survival brain. That is the part of the brain that's completely online when we're born. It's the reason babies cry when they need us, when they're cold or hungry uh, or lonely or bored at two o'clock in the morning as babies are so wont to do. So we pick the babies up, we soothe the babies, that quiets the amygdala. Every time we do that for one, two or three years, the hippocampus starts to grow. Look at the things that the hippocampus gives us. Emotional regulation. My friends, that means that if my amygdala is in overdrive and working because I am not feeling safe, I will not have the ability to regulate my emotions which goes back to self-care. But also teachers, look at that list of things kids need to learn. Truly, if children are not regulated, they cannot learn. And then the prefrontal cortex, which is the final journey through the limbic system. And that is logic and reason. That is the ability for children to make choices. 
Children who are amygdala driven do not choose their behaviors. If you are extremely angry and you say things that you don't mean, it's because you have amygdala driven response and you maybe are not logical and reasonable right now. When the amygdala is firing, it shuts down the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. So for children who are hungry or afraid, they may have a wonderfully safe home, but they're afraid to walk to school. Um, they might um, miss a parent who's, who's been lost to them. Grief and sorrow are a big part of amygdala-driven behaviors. And now you understand why this is so timely um, for current situations in our life. We are all suffering with this, a small amount or a large amount of grief for what used to be and our schedules and the things that we are familiar with. Please recognize that, that it's okay to mourn the loss of those things. If you are feeling anxious or short tempered, your amygdala is firing more than it usually does. Some types of self care and the strategies we're going to cover next can improve hippocampus function and make you and your children feel better. Please understand I am painting a very broad brush, if you will. Um, the brain is a very complicated organ and every one of us, our brains will do something different in response to all of this information. So if you say, well, Melissa, I don't find that I have four aces and you know, I don't have any, well, good for you. And one size fits one. You can have children who if um, I've met children who lost their parent, um, and their responses were vastly different. They were one year apart, these kids, and how they reacted and what happened to them as a result of that loss was very different in the two children. So please don't expect it to be the same for everyone. Okay, our third R, how do we respond in a trauma-informed way? Here it is, my friends. This is really, truly the secret of life. See, you didn't know you were going to learn that tonight when you tuned in. It circles because I want you to understand that these things are ongoing and forever building. But the biggest and most important one is what we call felt safety, feeling safe. Again, this is part of what's happening right now to many of us. We don't feel safe going out to the food store because it's very difficult to minimize the opportunity for you to be exposed to the COVID-19 virus. So when we don't feel safe, our stress response is heightened and it will make us more tired. It will make us short tempered. It can make us anxious. If we tended towards anxiety before this event, we are um, feeling much greater anxiety than we did before. Human beings need to be connected. We need to get regulated, I, as I was saying, about improving your overall health outcomes. If you learn to regulate, if you teach your children to regulate when they were feeling dysregulated, they will increase and improve their actual health outcomes as adults. And then when we are feeling safe and connected and we know how to regulate ourselves, then and only then can any of us truly learn. Okay, so what does it mean to feel safe? Words matter. What you say has everything to do with how your children feel. So consider these two words. Now, teachers, I know um, many teachers have signs up on their walls, red circles with lines through them over the word can't, because we want our children to believe that they can and that's lovely, leave those posters up. That's not the one I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about here is a, a perspective you have, just like those pictures we saw earlier. Do you believe people can't or that they won't? So if someone um, is not doing their homework, it's because they won't, they just won't. They're lazy, they don't wanna try, they don't care, they're not focused, or is it because they can't? They're unable. Can't people believe that people, children are all giving you the very best that they have? 
This is a trauma-informed approach, which is good for all of us. If we understand that everybody, including our spouses and partners, are giving us the best that they have, our response to them will be much more compassionate and much more trauma-informed. Because what upsets me about my children's behavior sometimes is that it hurts my feelings. Theo struggles um, with feeling trapped. So one of the things that he does as a teenager a lot is use very, very foul language. And it's very hard for me to listen as he storms up the stairs, cursing at me, about me. It hurts my feelings. And what I want to say is that's disrespectful. You can't speak to me that way. Possibly chase him up the stairs. I have learned that I need to give him a few minutes and then I go up to his room. If he could speak to me without cursing, he would. I ask you, parents, teachers, have you ever met a child that doesn't know what they're doing is wrong? Most of the time when, when we, when children calm down, did you know that, you know, you're not supposed to steal pencils off the teacher's desk? They do know that, but they can't use that to control their behavior when their amygdala is driving them. If we approach the kids as if they can't and not won't, we will automatically use words that are trauma informed. Here's another good example. What happens when you ask someone what's wrong with them? That's right. You're telling them there's something wrong with them. Instead, shift those words. How can I help? What's in your way? So back to Theo storming up the stairs and cursing at me. I wait a beat. I go upstairs. I open his bedroom door and I say, hey, pal, what's going on? How can I help? which generally brings about a whole different response from him than what I used to do, which was, who do you think you are? What's wrong with you? We don't curse in this house. And all those great things that, that made me feel better, but didn't actually solve the problem. You have to shift what you've always done to get different results. Okay. The other way that we can help all of us feel safe, particularly right now in this current pandemic, is predictability. But please keep in mind, these things are great when we are all back face to face with each other. Set a schedule. Classroom teachers, if your schedule is not up on the board or on the wall somewhere, I love those ones elementary school teachers use where you Velcro and you put different squares. Middle school teachers, even if you have kids for 45 minutes or a a uh, two period block, lay out the agenda for the period. This is what we're gonna do first, second, and third. It makes all of us feel safe when we know what's going to happen, which is part of why we don't feel safe right now. There's no one who can really tell us what's going to happen. You need to say, that's why I feel the way I do. I'm going to be okay. Okay. Consider time increments. This speaks to um, one of my favorite things about educators. Um, it's called the ballet of differentiation. Good teachers differentiate on the fly around their classrooms without even really thinking about it. So I know that um, Janice needs three questions instead of 20. I know that Thomas needs to answer the questions in a different way. I know. And the teachers are walking around the classroom providing different increments based on ability. Parents, you may not have any opportunity to understand how to do this. And if that's the case, I encourage you to email your teachers and talk to them. Again, if you're now finding that you are the proud teacher of your three children, uh, set a schedule. Don't forget that you can put in your own work time in that schedule time that the children do things so that you can get your work done. But make sure that you are, fit, are, are certain you understand what is an appropriate time increment for each of your three children. They will not have the same one. My son Noah can apply himself to a task until it's done, regardless of whether or not it's challenging for him. 
Theo can apply himself. Um, it used to be three minutes, then it was 10 minutes. Now it's about 15 minutes. But if he's stuck and doesn't get help, he quits. So his time increments are shorter than Noah's. Just make sure that you talk to your teacher, teachers send emails to parents and tell them what are good time increments for their children. I, I found this on the internet today. I think it's a great um, example of, of a daily schedule you could set up in your home right now. Um, if your children don't have chores, um, now is a good time to teach them to have them. I can tell you that I um, know very well what a two parent working hard family looks like. And um, before this wonderful opportunity of time, uh, I would do so many things for my children um, because of expediency, not because they couldn't be taught. Take the time now. If you have teenage children, nothing better than how to do laundry. Teach them how to do it. It's a great time for that. Because when we all get back to full speed, you're not going to have the time. You just need to get the laundry done because this is your 30 seconds for laundry before you do the next six other things. Please take time. If your child is five, they can learn to clean up. One of the greatest gifts you can give your children is cleaning up with them as toddlers and teaching them how to put things away. This grows the hippocampus. Sing a happy song. A couple of our cartoon characters have songs on how to clean up. Ask a preschool teacher. They all have great cleanup songs. Make it fun. As the children get older, they should be able to put away one activity before they start another. As your children grow, they should need less and less of your help. Every child is different. Some children need help organizing the cleanup longer than others. Oh, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we all had this just because we wanted it. But what I can tell you right now, work toward predictable mood. Say what you are feeling out loud. Please let your children know if they don't know that you're upset because the washing machine just broke and you don't know how to get anyone into your house to fix it, say that. I'm concerned right now because the washing machine's broken, but we're all okay. Because if you don't express it, they get afraid that they've done something wrong. Or particularly right now, children will imagine that something really bad is happening. Please speak your truth. You will be teaching your children to express themselves as well. And as I said, take a beat. This taking that minute before you respond to anyone, including your spouse or partner, will make for a better conversation. Okay, the next in our feel safe, be connected, get regulated, learn is be connected. For schools, I really recommend that you pay attention to online activity. If you have a child who hasn't handed something in, um, in my um, county right now in New Jersey, we have not gone to full virtual learning, which means that there's video opportunity to see your children. So I encourage you, if you don't, to um, tell your school counselors who will do what they would do if they were down the hall, only now maybe through an email. Um, I haven't seen, you know, Lucinda for a while. Does anybody know what's going on? Reach out, share the load. If you have five kids that haven't turned in any assignments, let your counselor know, let your principal know, let your administrators know through email that you have a KOC is what I call them in the schools I work with, kids of concern. I'm worried about. Um, reach out to your uh, municipal service providers. Um, they are still doing their work. Like everyone else, it looks very different, but our child welfare agencies are still at work. So ask them to do a wellness check, to check on the family, to check on the child. Maybe it's a technology problem, which right now could isolate children. In the house, please ask questions. I was startled as a teacher to find out that as a parent, I never asked any questions. It's because I was in such a hurry. How are you feeling? What we do in our house and still do it now that I have a 20 year old and a 16 year old, we call them highs and lows. And whenever we gather to do something, family dinner, everybody shares a high and a low. It's wonderful practice. 
It teaches your children to express themselves and to share what they're thinking. Do not assume that you know what your beautiful little babies are thinking. Teach them to tell you. Have game night. Have uh, family dinners. Have family outdoor activities. This is our golden chance. We have time. It is the one gift we are given from this whole thing. Use that time. Look at your children. One of the things that also is an excellent idea is to make sure that you do um, no screens. So make sure that you put down the screens that now have become such a big part of our lives when you do games and when you do um, your, your family activities. Get regulated, co-regulate. So tell your children, I'm gonna learn to um, quiet myself. So I wanna feel peaceful and I like to use silly putty or I like to color or I like to blow bubbles because it makes me feel peaceful. Talk to your children about that, find whatever works. Everybody in your house may have a different tool or a couple of different tools. Turns out I like to knit, who knew? I won't tell you how old I am, but it's old enough to know that you would think that you can't teach this dog new tricks. And turns out I like the feel of the yarn and I have been knitting with all of this time that I have. It makes me very regulated. There are lots of different opportunities. If it feels good, it's regulating for you, provided you know that it's safe. And then we can learn. We all must be in our thinking brain, our prefrontal cortex with the support of our hippocampus to be able to learn. We have to quiet our amygdala to do so. Oh, this work starts and ends with you. Teachers, I know that many of you are feeling more validated than you have in a long time. I'm sorry it's come to this for that to happen, but um, you should know that um, there are research studies that show that teachers have the stress response system similar to emergency room nurses upon retirement. In some cases, that is higher than firefighters. Please, if you are a firefighter, you know that you need to take care of yourself because you override your survival instinct when you run into a fire. Teachers, when you run into a fire, you sit down and try to have a relationship with that fire. You have to take care of yourselves in this work, in this time. Parents, you are now their parents and their teachers. That is incredibly stressful for most of us. Please understand that you have to take care of yourself so that you can take care of the ones you love. Here's some ideas. Take a good look at those. And again, this could be a limitless list of things. Whatever works for you. Make sure that you add that into the predictable schedule you're going to create with your family. Where is our self-care in this schedule? How are we taking care of ourselves? With that, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, there are um, some resources there. The Attachment and Trauma Networks uh, website is there. Trauma Sensitive Resources is my website. I have a book list on my website um, of, of every area of trauma-informed education you can imagine if you'd like to dig into this. And AcesConnection.com is a, a fabulous place to learn more about ACES. Well, Melissa, thank you so very much. We have a couple questions for you. Are you ready? Yes. All right, so what are your thoughts about supporting graduating seniors during this unpredictable time? And that would be graduating high school and college seniors. My heart goes out to all of those kids. Um, what I think teachers and parents need to do is to make them feel special. This is a very special time. So their senior year is going to be different than the senior years ever. And that will stand out. Um, there are a lot of dedicated parents and educators, administrators working on 
what we will do if schools are not back in session for graduation. I know that teachers, administrators, parents care very much about these rites of passage. Um, and I know that something will be done. So what I suggest is that you ask your kids, because I, I can tell you, particularly high school kids, their communication with each other has not slowed down. It is the one benefit to the fact that they live online anyway. I asked my 16 year old high school junior the other day, are you feeling isolated? And he looked at me and said, mom, I see my friends more now than I did when we were at school. So he's not feeling isolated, but he's also not a senior. So have your seniors talk about what it might look like. They are the digital natives, my friends. They probably have better ways to do this virtually than we could ever imagine. Include them in the conversation and tell them that something will be done. Okay. How can fears associated with COVID-19 be normalized for children? Talk about it. Um, I helped my neighbor's children understand that they are um, seven and nine. I talked about the flu. And of course the little nine-year-old was, you know, my, my dad got the flu last year. And so I was like, this is a different kind of flu. And then I compared it to horses and zebras because zebras are a type of horse, but very different. So that's what's happening. And we don't know how to fight the virus yet, but we learned how to fight the flu and we will learn how to fight this one. Um, it just came upon us faster than we're used to. Um, showing them, I would definitely look at this stuff yourself first, but I found some great information about the influenza. It was a great history lesson um, that we did with our students um, and taught them about the flu and showed them that it actually looked a hundred years ago, very much like this, um, making it um, not so scary is the best thing that you can do. But also please ask your children what they're afraid of. They will probably tell you. Okay, and one more question. Our last question for this evening. What does a successful return from shelter in place look like? What's important to keep in mind? When the kids come back into your schools, I would do, I, uh, regardless whether this happens in May or June or we don't see our students in a school until September, organize and plan for the first six weeks of school. If you're familiar with responsive classroom, then you're familiar with how you build a community, you do get to know you activities. Meanwhile, the teacher is checking on the social, emotional and physical health of all of her children before the true learning gets in place. I know that we are all very concerned about possibly some lost time this year. No one can learn if they're not in their thinking brain. So I would, as a, as a grade level team, as a school together, spend time thinking about what the re-entry lessons will look like. Back all the way up. If you get your students back in your classroom before the summer break, I would still treat it very much like you would treat it in September. Talk to the children about how they're doing. Some of them are going to look very different to you than they did before this event occurred. Take the time to give them the time they need in school to reacclimate themselves to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saden. Thank you for your wisdom, your expertise, your caring. Really appreciate your being, being here with us tonight. Not just tonight, but we're very appreciative too that you are part of the DuPage ROE, our um, BJA staff grant. You've been just wonderful, um, you know, working with our school districts all throughout DuPage County. And we look forward to um, meeting with you again next week. So thank you, and we hope that all of you all of you can join us again too. So have a great evening. Be safe. Take care. <laughs>